Good afternoon. Welcome to the Tweet Time Weekly Podcast, where we're going to be talking about all things games. I'm your host, Anthony Greffer. We're going to get straight into it, as we always do. Uh, first off, we're going to start talking about Drive Club. So, Drive Club, if you don't know what that is, is a PlayStation 4 exclusive. It's a obviously a driving game with the name Drive Club, um, but there's been a bunch of problems with the game since it launched um, a couple of months ago now. So, we've had uh, a, pu- a couple of post-launch updates from the company, um, from I think it's Evolution Studios is the is the creator behind the game. Um, they've kind of apologised by offering free DLC for the game, which isn't too bad. It's like an olive branch that they're reaching out to the gamers with instead of going, you know, our game is stuffed. Here's a couple of patches. We hope it's better soon. They're at least doing something. Uh, we've had the president and CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America, Sean Layden, uh, talking about it. And this is where we get into a, a couple of things that we're going to talk about after this quote. So Layden was quoted saying, in the development cycle, we try to do all things. In the development cycle, we, te- we try to test against every possibility. We have a quality assurance team. We have a QA plan. You do a beta test, you scope against that. But now in a connected world, you can't effectively test in your house or in your beta group what, is, what it means to have 50,000 or 100,000 or 200,000 users hit your service. And the guys at the studio are struggling with that throwing up things that they had not anticipated so what they're complaining about is obviously the uh, obviously the game is a kind of like a massively multiplayer online game where you might have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands like they said of gamers in the game at once using all the various services and it's not having a great time um, a lot of the problems are stemming obviously from that but then you've also got to ask a question is oh no ask a question that maybe they weren't prepared for this you know, how can you, but then at the same time, how can you, how can you prepare for that? And then you've got to think these games aren't just little indie games that seem to launch, indie games launch without these kinds of problems, but they're launching these massive games where they know that there would have been massive amounts of games. Maybe they should have had an open beta test or drop the price of Drive Club and with Drive, maybe in 12 or 24 months time, release Drive Club 2 or release another game where it kind of tests the servers and, and test the infrastructure first you know, maybe six or 12 months before Drive Club comes out. But they seem to have just, you know, you'd sell a full price game and give you a half-baked promise and then patch it up along the way. I I don't like that. I'm not a console gamer, um, but it seems to be that's the, the way that things are run these days, which is, which is not good at all. Uh, moving on from that, we saw during the week, um, uh, just a day ago, I should say, that there's the biggest Counter-Strike um, Global Offensive tournament that's about to kick off, DreamHack Open Winter. Uh, a few of the professional games are actually banned from the game, which is not good at all. Uh, the players have actually been issued in-game bans, so when they go to these you know, kind of events and they go to register, they're going to be back banned, which is Valve's anti-cheat, um, anti-cheat kind of protocol, um, and banned off of other services. I think there's one called ESEA, uh, which is a third-party mani- uh, matchmaking client for Counter-Strike Go. Um, go. So we have massive problems there, and I think that this is gonna be the tip of the iceberg of, of a new kind of scandal um, of pro gamers that people think are pro, but they've actually been hacking, or at least hacking sometime, maybe not all the time, um, maybe a little bit of hack that's not noticeable, but it just gives them that edge to be a pro gamer. If this kind of thing does blow up, um, I think there's gonna be, a, I think there, there should be, and I'm, I'm guessing there will be, a massive investigation into it, because there's sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake at these kinds of events. Um, like this one, for example, uh, DreamHack um, is, a, is a massive event in Sweden with the $250,000 prize pool for Counter-Strike Go. So you, that's not just a little bit of money. That's not like you're going, oh, here guys, it's a LAN, here's some free Coke or a free game or a hundred bucks or even a thousand dollars, you're looking at 250 grand, that's some life-changing kind of cash. Um, and for there to be hacking involved in that, that's that's not good at all. Uh, I don't agree with that, I don't condone it. Um, it's like steroids for sports, you know, if you can't play fair, don't play at all. Um, then we had Michael report during the week of a uh, sexist, sexy Dr. PlayStation Vita ad from Sony, which the company has since pulled. 
Um, they took a massive amount of criticism for the ad, um, which involved a, uh, a female doctor, um, a sexy female doctor, I, sh- I should add, um, mentioning um, uh, innuendos of masturbation. Um, and it turned out that it was actually supposed to be related to the PlayStation Vita gaming console. Um, this kind of stuff, it's, it's funny that this, this kind of thing gets pulled because there's so many people that will like it but then it'll affect that little amount of people. Like, I understand that it's offensive, but women are objectified in society anyway. Like, you go to any of these gaming events or go to Computex or go to CES, any of these events, it's all sexy women everywhere. But I don't understand. Sony does it to try and laugh uh, and trying to trying to laugh with and appeal to those types of gamers and they're criticized for it. So I do understand. I'm not saying that I... Um, that I would do it uh, if it was if it was up to me I wouldn't have had that kind of ad out in the first place but hey at least they've pulled it and they haven't tried to be uh, you know idiots about it and try to try to reverse their actions by going oh we're so sorry about the ad we didn't mean to do it uh, speaking of stupidity Bloodsport the ultimate in immersive gaming uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this or seen it um, all the links to all the subjects that we're talking about are going to be in the link section below which I'll have in this post that you'll see below the video um, but Bloodsport actually hit Kickstarter if you don't know what it is um, it's uh, it's like an intravenous line that gets put into your arm um, and then um, connected to the game world so every time you actually get hit by a bullet or punched in a game um, or whatever you know bodily reaction that hits you or you fall or whatever you actually get uh, blood taken from you so the unit um, uh, connects to a, ga- a console game controller and then uh, the blood collection is done uh, any time that you're hit or damaged within a game um, it's been pulled from Kickstarter obviously uh, I don't see why they thought that it would have lasted on Kickstarter and why these guys thought it was a good idea probably just for the for, for the lols and just for the headlines that you know people like me are talking about it right now um but the project have been active since november 18 and it's november 26 today here in australia number 25 at night in the states um uh, but yeah it's uh it's been pulled kickstarter has a policy um that it won't discuss why certain projects are, are suspended but it's pretty obvious why this would be suspended so uh the company itself hasn't said anything um they haven't responded to multiple requests from media um but if they're out there and i'll talk about it send us an email I doubt that they will. They probably want some blood from us if they do that, and I'm not prepared to, to give them my blood. Um, Xbox and Sony, uh, Xbox and PlayStation, and Microsoft versus Sony. The the war that everyone thinks that there is, you know, they they each have their own customers and each have their own markets and each have their own strengths and weaknesses and 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 staff and and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's been a great year for both companies. Uh, Microsoft started off slow. Sony really took a big lead in the beginning, but Microsoft have really caught up in the last couple of months. Um, they've had some great exclusives and they've dropped their price as well as dropping their Kinect bundle from the from the Xbox One bundle, dropping from $499 US to $399 US. Um, but we've had um, Xbox boss Phil Spencer um, applauding both uh, his company and Sony. Um, saying, quote unquote, this first year has been incredible. Great launch for two consoles, exciting competition and great games. Thanks for all the support and feedback. Those Sony peeps had a great first year. So it was good to see um, uh, someone like Phil Spencer saying great things about Sony. I think it's I think it's good when you get both sides of the camp applauding each other. I don't see why there has to be such rivalry between the two companies. Um I think, I think again. I think it's great. They both they both work with the same kind of partners like Ubisoft and EA. There's only a couple of games that they really have that are exclusive to each other's platforms. Um, uh, there's a lot more multi-platform games than there have been um, pretty much ever, which is which is good for gamers, but probably not so good for uh, for Microsoft and Sony because there's no distinct uh, distinction between the consoles. Uh, which one do you buy? There's only you know a couple of changes between them: the controller, maybe Xbox Live or PSN or whatever you want to uh, decide between. Um, as for the, the success rate on the PlayStation and Xbox, the Xbox One has sold around 10 million units since launch, with the PlayStation 4 at about 13.5. So not too bad. Um, I think Xbox 360 and PS3 are, are way above that, um, maybe in the, the 50 million inch mark or 40 million inch mark. Um, but I wouldn't expect the next-gen consoles to ramp up that quick. Um, 
we have a continuation of Sony. So Sony have been, this is this is a kind of uh, business um, related, uh, not so much game related, but it does have an impact with Sony's gaming um, division. So Sony have said that they're gonna be reducing their TV and smartphone product lineups, um, obviously because they're not as successful versus someone like Samsung, who's really quite successful in both the TV and mobile phone market. Um, so Sony are going to be moving more of their time, R&D and cash out of the TV and mobile phone markets into the console and image sensor market. Sony makes some, some incredible sensors. Uh, the Sony Xperia Z2, for example, um, I use that as my daily driving smartphone. And the sensor that's in this is amazing. Um, my wife has the Galaxy S5 and I was just in Melbourne a couple of days ago. Uh, you guys might have even seen some of the images that I took. Um, that I was posting up on our Facebook page of like the Bitcoin ATM um, and stuff like that. Uh, and the, what was it? The Samsung Gear VR headset. And this is an incredible sensor. Um, I absolutely love it. I think it's, I, I've been using this for about six months now. Um, I've gone from the Nexus 5 to the LG G3 to the Samsung Galaxy S5, the Galaxy Note 3. Um, and I think that's about it. I've got a BlackBerry on its way. Um, I really want to get myself one of the Moto X second generation um, phones. But this, the Sony phone, I've recommended a lot of friends. Um, I've probably five or six, I think, that have bought the, the Z2 just off my, off my recommendation um, versus getting the Galaxy S5. And they love it. Every single person that I've recommended has loved it. Um, so if you want a phone and you want to get Android, this is, this is a really, really nice handset. This is a Z2, but the Z3 is actually out as well. Um, continuing to what we were saying before, so Sony are moving away from spending more money on their on their TV business and on their um, smartphone business, so they can concentrate on image sensors and their gaming consoles, which is great. They're they're going towards their strengths and not their weaknesses. Instead of throwing money at something that's going to constantly make a loss, they're probably not looking at the twelve or twenty four month kind of timelines. Maybe looking five ten years down the track. I think it's going to, I think it's great because Sony are most likely going to start succeeding more with the PlayStation, continuing that um, that effort that they've already put in, continuing the good run that they've already had, putting more and more time and more and more effort because the, the amount of people and the amount of R&D and the amount of money that I would have been spending on TVs, which is a huge chunk, and smartphones, which is a huge chunk because of the marketing behind it, TVs and smartphones being gigantic, they can put that money towards uh, PlayStation and image sensors. There was a t there was a tease that we did um, a couple of a couple of days a couple of weeks ago. I will try and find it now. The tweet time. Um, it was uh, in regards to a Sony image sensor. Um, yeah, here we go. So we reported a couple of uh, about a week ago now. Uh, Sony's new Xmor, so E X M O R R S I M X two thirty stacked CMOS image sensor. Um, it's an incredible sensor that we're probably going to see baked into smartphones next year. Um, Sony said that it will capture 21 megapixel still photos, and it's the first CMOS image sensor for smartphones that features an onboard image plane phase detection AF single processing function, something that can use up to 190 autofocus points. So what you're going to see with that is that you're going to see again, you're going to you're going to have a phone that can just you know you can be your kid can be moving. Like I have a young daughter that's always on the go, she's running everywhere crazy, 300 million kilometers an hour, and you can just move it and, and quickly it'll 192 focus points will just it'll line up and just snap a photo instantaneously, which is which is absolutely great. Um, and I'll, again, I'll put a link. Um, I'll actually make a note of that. I'll put a link um, to that in the in the news um, uh, in this in this post. That image sensor is, is going to be something that's going to be quite incredible next year. I'm hoping that we maybe get a tease of it at CES, which which we're going to be there covering. Um, but we but we don't know uh, when Sony are going to be doing anything with that image sensor. Most likely second half of next year. I'm guessing maybe with the Z4 announcement, the Xperia Z4 smartphone that is. Or maybe a new tablet um, or maybe something completely new. Especially if they're cutting focus from TV and TV and um, smartphones. Maybe they're going to be pushing more into image sensors and selling them to other people. Uh, maybe like um, like Apple, for example. Uh, Apple are usually renowned for their cameras. And I absolutely love the camera in the iPhone 6 Plus. Maybe we might see Sony pushing more of their image sensors into devices where there's more profits. Versus putting their own image sensors into their own smartphones, which might not sell as well, and there might not be as much as much profits. So again, we'll we'll see how that goes. Continuing with the console news, um, Michael reported um, just a couple of hours ago now um, about the Xbox physical, the Xbox One's physical design. 
So the person who designed the console uh, or the project manager behind it, Carl Ledbetter, was talking about the physical design, um, responding to criticism of the bulkiness of the Xbox One. I personally think it's bulky, so they can criticize as much as they want. I'm on that camp. Considering that it has an APU and pretty much so does a smartphone like this and it's only thin and tiny, I don't see why the Xbox One is so bloody big. It is absolutely huge. It doesn't have massive power draw like the like a PC would with a GPU that uses two or 300 watts of power. Um, but, but anyway, so Ledbetter, he said he understands that not everyone was happy with the console. Um, he explained the growing pains, uh, trying to overcome certain hardware design barriers that people seem to take for granted, um, which I don't, I don't see where the hardware barriers are here. It's a massive console with a tiny single chip solution. So he said, everybody gets frustrated because what we want is for everything to be wafer thin, not, uh, not get hot and just be a snap to put together. But the reality is that there are very real issues around cooling when you're pushing some numbers of watts, uh, pushing some number of watts in the processor. Therefore, the thing has to have some size to it. There's always an interesting dynamic between engineering and design and constraints around performance. It's called designing with constraints, and constraints create very real things for people to, uh, very real things for people to after and that doesn't make any sense. Very real things for people to after and solve. Blue Sky can get a little tough because it's limitless and bound, uh, boundless. The engineering doesn't really become a barrier. Engineering is necessary, just like the design and technology. It's a combination of everything that creates the product. So I do get that, but it's just a, it's a bulky console. Admit it. There's, you could make a thin console because if it's not a bulky console, then you won't ever release an Xbox One Slim. So, which I'm pretty sure we'll see next year with the news of AMD uh, talking about releasing a 20nm based chip. So we should see a thinner Xbox One in the near future. Uh, so the last couple of stories we have. What do you want first? Grand Theft Auto 5 on PC, the Assassin's Creed Unity patch, Ubisoft. Um, we'll leave Ubisoft to last because I, I really enjoy what they've been doing lately. Um, so GTA 5 on PC. I am waiting for this. I didn't really enjoy GTA 4 that much. The mobile phone really annoyed me in the game. Um, but GTA 5... We reported just a couple of hours ago, it's been a hot story today, that's going to be including just for PC features, one of which is going to be a video editor. So there's a lot of videos that are actually released for GTA 5 um, built in-game, but having an in-game video editor is going to be something completely different uh, completely different to anything that's ever been shown off before in the game, um, especially with the open world kind of um, fun that you can have in the game. With a video editor and multiplayer, you're going to have an insane amount of YouTube videos they're going to be made from Grand Theft Auto 5 on PC. Um, so it's being reported now that there's going to be a video editor mode just for the PC. Um, and in addition to this, there's actually going to be modding built into the game instead of it being an afterthought by the community. If Rockstar really support the modding community, it's going to be two, It's going to be going two ways. It's going to really have massive support from the PC user base, which I think is going to be absolutely great. I think it's something that they really should have... Um, they really should have concentrated on before maybe releasing GTA 5 simultaneously on Xbox One, Xbox 360, PS3, PS4, and PC, but they're releasing it in three stages. Obviously, last year we had Xbox 360 and PS3. Just last, or last about 10 days ago, we had um, uh, Xbox One and PS4 launch for GTA 5, and January 27, 2015, so about five, six weeks away, we have... Um, uh, no, what am I saying? Five, six weeks ago away. That's about two months away. We have GTA 5 on PC. Um, if they support mods, it's going to be great, but I think the second part of it is it's going to hurt consoles. Um, well, not really hurt console styles, but people are going to be asking, why can't, it, why can't the console versions run the mods? Like We have PC, uh, consoles that are super powerful now, but it's the controls. You know, It's hard to make levels and games and, and, and do all that kind of like uh, or video using video editors on a console. If you could hook up a mouse and keyboard, then maybe, but then you have to build the software within the, the operating system for the console versus building the software in normal you know normal code that you want on a PC. So I understand um, why they're doing it on PC, but it is gonna it's gonna anger a lot of gamers uh, on consoles, but it's gonna make PC gamers absolutely love it. Alright, so finishing up on our podcast for the week, um, we have Ubisoft news. So we have three pieces of news to share with you today. Uh, Ubisoft has been a huge kicking bag for us for the last couple of weeks. Um, first off, Assassin's Creed Unity. It's still being patched, and I think it will be patched for the next 20 or 30 years or so. 
Uh, so Ubisoft are supposedly releasing or are patching up the game and they're going to be fixing a lot of the performance related issues with the PC version and the console version. Um, so on the PC or on the on on the on all three platforms, the Xbox One, PS4, and PC, they're releasing performance related um, uh, fixes into the latest patch. So there's four uh, four uh, bits that are being fixed up with the latest patch, um, where it improves the general frame rate on the PS4 by lowering the priority of the online services thread. The second one is fix the frame rate drop while Arno climbs on the RHP building of Palais de Justice. Uh, fix the FPS drop when climbing and pressing a left stick towards somewhere that is not climbable in certain areas and fix the FPS drop in Saint Chapelle. Now the third one is yeah the fix FPS drop in, when climbing and pressing the left stick towards somewhere that is not climbable in certain areas. How do they not see those kinds of things in the QA testing? I don't understand. I don't understand any of Assassin's Creed Unity how they are able to f that thing up so bad that it's just it's just it's just in shambles. It needs another couple of months work minimum. But then Ubisoft, on the other hand, can release something like Far Cry 4, which is awesome um, and runs well. And sure, it's not perfect, but compared to Assassin's Creed Unity, it's perfect. So I don't understand um, where that went wrong. It's its own podcast on its own, and we're actually probably going to have a podcast um, in a couple of days, um, probably early next week, maybe. That's going to cover a lot of the a lot of the Ubisoft uh, stuff with Far Cry 4 and the crew and uh, Assassin's Creed Unity, of course. So moving on to more Assassin's Creed, not Assassin's Creed, but moving on to more Ubisoft related news. We have the company coming out warning people today to not trust the early reviews of The Crew. Now The Crew is their open world driving game um, and they're actually warning people to not trust the early reviews because of the amount of people they're actually playing within the game are actually affecting a lot of the reviews and preview sessions that Ubisoft has set up for, game, or for, for the press. Which of course we weren't invited to, but I don't, I don't see why we ever would be invited to a Ubisoft um, event because we actually talk our minds and aren't completely gagged by getting free games. So Ubisoft have actually said, without me reading out the quote, which again you can just read in the in the post that we have below um, below this video. Um, so they're pretty much saying that they can't uh, when so they had they had press and media um, and reviewers come into Ubisoft or um, Ubisoft offices and show off obviously the crew and get people to play it and then the, obviously that they were playing it but they weren't able to um weren't able to get the full full experience of the game because it was just you know you'd have like maybe a room or a, a hotel um floor filled up with all these tvs and stations set up and they couldn't explore various parts of the map because you needed to have more of the competitive side and more of the cooperative side um being played and used but you can't do that when you don't have an actual rule set of people doing it so you, it's kind of like playing say a 32 versus 32 battlefield 4 kind of match but with only 10 people you're not going to get the full use you're not going to you're not going to get the full experience of the true battlefield 4 uh world so that that's where this is that's where the crew is it's i understand it's hard to review because you it's it's, it's the kind of game that actually really requires um the online world to be there and be working and have thousands of people online playing or just a couple of friends um, but they're actually warning people to not trust the other reviews so I think the crew is going to get ripped apart probably 60-70% in reviews um, and then I think it's the kind of game where it will hopefully get better um, maybe 3-4 months from now but it's the same thing as Assassin's Creed the same thing as Drive Club these games are being launched and it's like oh but they're you have to wait, you know, don't trust the other reviews, don't trust the preview sessions that we held. It's like, well, show the game off then. Show me the game being played. But if you can't and you're hoping that people are just going to know how to play the game and that they're going to buy it based on other reviews that are telling them not to buy the game, how it's not going to sell. Like, they've gone through multiple betas it's, it's, and most people aren't that happy with it. It's had so many problems. But we're going to find out in a week. Uh, the crew launches on Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS4 and PC on December 2. So not too long away from now. Finally, we have Halo the Master Chief Collection, which has been in shambles for the last couple of weeks since it launched. So 343 Industries, which is the developer behind the game, along with Microsoft, they um, remastered uh, uh, various Halo games and released them as the Master Chief Collection. And it's been a mess uh, in terms of the matchmaking for the game. Um, it's just been an absolute mess. People can't find their friends or find other people to play with. It's just broken. 
and the company knows it. They've pledged to fix it, of course, um, with the, I think it's the, the 343, uh, 343 Industries boss, Bonnie Ross, um, writing in a letter to fans to say that um, they released the game. We're really sorry that the, that it's been, um, it hasn't been working. Um, and then she said, I personally apologize for this on behalf of all of us at 343 Industries. Our team is committed to working around the clock until these issues are resolved. But again, I have a question. Didn't you test it? Did you not test it at all? How do you launch a game this big, the Halo franchise, pending on Halo 5 coming out next year on Xbox One, and you release a game like this, where the one component that people are going to be using is multiplayer, and the matchmaking isn't working properly? To me, that's just stupid. I'm not a game developer. I don't know about coding and any of that kind of stuff, but the marketing side of it, it I can make sense of, and the and the reception, and people like me who write about it and talk about it, and people who will listen to me, in my opinion. It's just a mess. I, If this was me, I would just delay it. I don't care what people would say. Oh, I don't have any trust you delayed the game. You must be having a problem with it. But who cares? You know, I'd rather, I'd rather delay the game and keep my integrity versus releasing these games like Assassin's Creed and The Crew and Far Cry and, and Halo Master Chief Collection. And it's just a, a, a massive slew of problems that they keep having. This is matchmaking problems, performance issues. Oh, don't play the game until until the reviews are out. You know, it's just it's just a massive mess. Um, at least three, four, three industries are coming out and admitting that they are wrong, admitting that there's problems, admitting that their focus is actually getting the problems fixed. Uh, versus Ubisoft, for example, who didn't say jack when Assassin's Creed Unity launched. They just didn't really acknowledge it. They just dumped the game out, kept the embargoes on their reviewers for days and uh, for hours and hours and hours. But 343 Industries is actually acknowledging that there's problems. So good on you guys for actually for actually doing that. Um, but I think that you should be doing something more. Um, you look at Ubisoft, um, oh, sorry, uh, Evolution Studios with Drive Club. They're offering free DLC. Why can't 343 Industries do it? Drop 30% off of the price for the people who buy it now. Um, give, them a, give them a credit towards Halo 5 when it comes out. Um, give them free DLC. Uh, do something because there's. A, I've actually been looking through um, uh, through Reddit and uh, a few a uh, few other gaming sites where people have said that they're, that's it. Um, a three four a three four a three, a three four three industries is actually on their shit list and that's it. They're not buying any more games from them. Um, they've returned the game, gotten a full refund, and that's what you don't want. You don't want to be returned. You don't want gamers returning your game. Because once they've returned their game, it's kind of like breaking up with you. They will not want to be with you anymore. They will not want to actually give you their money. You know, that's a that's a big a big deal that that now um, Microsoft are going to have to be dealing with again. What's the what's the marketing for Halo Five going to be like? Is it going to have matchmaking problems? We don't know. Um, that's it for this week's um, quick under thirty minute podcast um, for games. There will be a technology one probably sometime tomorrow. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the, the return for the, the gaming podcast. Um, there'll be a much more interesting change to the podcast next week. We have someone that will be joining me. Uh, we have TT Esports previous community manager, Chris Smith, who is also based in Australia. Um, he's going to be joining me on next week's podcast where we're going to rip the entire crap out of Ubisoft and everything they've been dealing with for the last couple of months. Thanks for tuning in.